I'm a formerly incarcerated person. Um, spent quite a bit of my years uh, confined in uh, New York State uh, prisons and facilities. And during this last stint, I actually served uh, 33 years before my release in 2011. And uh, I served 33 years, I mentioned that, but I had a sentence actually uh, with a 15 year minimum. I was denied parole nine times, as I said, because of something that was immutable, that would never change. Uh, I was denied parole uh, because of the nature of my criminal offense. When I appeared before my first parole board in 1993, uh, I had made major achievements during that 15-year uh, period. I had actually uh, obtained four college degrees, two of the master's degrees. I had been involved with creating uh, rehabilitative programs behind the walls. Uh, most of which still exist today. Farid's story is not unique. He is a victim of a system of mass incarceration in which one in every 35 people in the United States is in prison, on probation, or on parole. That is the highest rate in the world. Of course, some are more likely to go to prison than others. If you are a black male, for instance, there is a one in three chance you will be imprisoned at some point in your lifetime. The other important part of this story is something called indeterminate sentencing, those without a definite number of years in prison. You could get 3 to 5 years, 10 to 20 years, or, like Farid, 15 years to life. For many of those people, getting out of prison before their maximum has proven to be a daunting task. So the notion of an indeterminate sentence was to assure that someone convicted of a crime uh, would serve a specified period of time uh, in prison for a felony crime and that at the end of that period he or she would become eligible for uh, consideration of release. Uh, so who's going to handle whether or not a person gets release? We call it the parole board. The parole board is made up of a maximum of 19 people and is charged with denying or granting release to the tens of thousands of incarcerated people with indeterminate sentences who have reached their minimum sentence or who were denied parole two years earlier. Though today indeterminate sentences are mostly reserved for those convicted of nonviolent felonies, until 1998 those convicted of violent felonies were also likely to receive an indeterminate sentence. So increasingly, the pool of people appearing before the parole board is made of those with long, indeterminate sentences handed out for violent offenses prior to 1998. Until 2011, Farid was one of those people. I was tried for uh, a murder and uh, attempt murder on a police officer. And uh, my defense for the murder was uh, justification, self-defense. It was a street fight uh, where I was attacked. Uh, my defense for the attempt murder on the police officer was that it never ever happened. Uh, it was actually uh, a plain clothes officer who happened to put the scene at the end of the fight and claimed that uh, during the, during, during the end of the fight that I actually spun on him and uh, clicked the gun, that he heard a click, and that uh, the gun didn't fire. Uh, so I went to trial. Uh, I was found not guilty of the murder on the uh, person who was killed, but found guilty of the attempt murder on the police officer. And an attempt on a police officer in New York carries the same penalty as the completed crime. And though uh, this person hadn't received a scratch, uh, the, the least amount that I could be sentenced to 
was uh, 15 years to life. If we're to maintain the system that we have, where the parole board just dismisses people because of what they originally did, then we create a system where people don't care if they change. There's no incentive to actually change their heart, change their mind, make plans to be positive members of their community, because it doesn't actually matter in the end, you know? I had no training. When I came on the board, I was told by a colleague how to file my expense account. And I sat in one day at Danamora, and the next week, I was on my own. But now you generally go to a, an office type location uh, and uh, interview the, uh, the, the inmate, for want of a better term, uh, through video conferencing. With a video conferencing, it's like watching TV. It's passive. You know, you're looking back up, you know, like you watch a TV. Maybe if you're not doing the interview part of the thing, you might lose, lose a little bit of attention. It's, it's very passive. And it really doesn't get to what you're trying to determine, is that inmate or offender ready for community uh, rehabilitation or reintegration? I see the statistics of release online every month. Uh, they've gone down, I think in May, they were at a 29% release rate for the initial candidates. Um, they were woefully lacking when I was there, and it was at 50% something when I was there. Ms. Treen's numbers are actually a little low. 20% of those appearing before the board for the first time are granted release, while only 15% of those reappearing are released. All in all, that's more than 10,000 denials every year. The Parole Reform Act passed in 1977 and implemented official guidelines for the Board of Parole to, quote, structure their use of discretion. These guidelines insisted that the board adopt a presumption in favor of release once someone had served their minimum term. A closer look at those guidelines, though, helps explain how the board's default today is still to deny, deny, deny. There's supposed to be three factors, that the major factors that the pro board must consider by law. In New York State, it's Executive Law 259. First, they have to consider whether release at that, this, that particular time is incompatible with the welfare of society. Then they have to consider whether there is, if, if the person is released at that time, there is a reasonable probability, and I'm just reading from this statute here, that you would not live and remain at liberty without violating the law. And third, uh, whether release at this time would so deprecate the nature of the instant offense as to undermine respect for the law. Okay, so the guidelines are vague. There is no further explanation as to what might factor into determining someone's release would be incompatible with the welfare of society or would so deprecate the nature of the instant offense as to undermine respect for the law. But then further down the page, I found this. Quote, in its discretion, the parole board may revise or modify the guidelines in whole or in part. It, it tells them to be basing the decision on, on the person's readiness to be released. And yet it also tells them that they can look at a bunch of criteria, which includes the nature of the crime, and, and, they, and they can weight any of those criteria any way they want. It turns out that the parole board has discretion over the extent to which it follows its own guidelines. Guidelines that were originally implemented to hold the board accountable for its inconsistent use of discretion in the first place. These are very, unfortunately, very subjective decisions. It's not based on who the person has become, it's based on what they did sometimes 20 or 30 years ago. Back to that discretion thing, a lot of people say, well, but how can you say they can't uh, look at the crime. Well, we never said they can't look at the crime. All we're saying is you can't make it the only reason you're not releasing the person. I think that parole, the parole board is afraid to let out people with violent histories for fear they recommit a crime. Um, and they get a lot of pressure sometimes from the victim's community or from the police community. You know, there have been academics who study parole release rates generally, and 
they always dip whenever there's a gubernatorial election, right? Right before the election, during the election, maybe right after the election, because no governor you know, wants during his or her election cycle to have something horrible. Bush and Dukakis on crime. Bush supports the death penalty for first-degree murderers. Dukakis not only opposes the death penalty, he allowed first-degree murderers to have weekend passes from prison. One was Willie Horton, who murdered a boy in a robbery, stabbing him 19 times. Despite a life sentence, Horton received 10 weekend passes from prison. Horton fled, kidnapped a young couple, stabbing the man and repeatedly raping his girlfriend. Weekend prison passes. Dukakis on crime. So parole boards don't want to be the parole board that creates the Willie Horton problem. Um, it becomes a situation where the person making the decision is saying, on some level, maybe not even consciously, but on some level, well, that's bad. That person is bad. That person doesn't deserve a second ch chance because of the stigma. There is a stigma that says, that categorizes people, that says once a criminal, always a criminal. Once you've uh, offended, you'll always offend. So that it feeds that, um, it feeds the decision of uh, parole decisions. And what it also does is it makes it okay to keep denying people. Because if society says that population is generally undeserving, who cares? Who cares? They don't, they don't look at the good things that you accomplish as well. You're a felon. So even when you're in there, you're still labeled as a felon, you're dangerous, you're manipulative, you everything that's evil and bad. So it's very scary. The women who were um, inmates, uh, men always felt, male commissioners, that they were being manipulated. That if somebody looked two together, it was feminine wiles. That if somebody looked frazzled, uh, she was going to go out there and pick the wrong guy to lead her around. And she was not a good, good risk. Um, there was always some way. I remember sitting on a board once working uh, with somebody. And he said to me afterward, did you notice her lipstick and her nail polish were the same color? Wow, you know, wow. Well, he denied her for reasons that he went into to say what that spoke to him about. I look at it as having a society that generally doesn't think about these issues, that has no um, direct tie to, the, to these issues, so that they need to be informed. They need to hear the stories of people who are at the end of the day, human beings. Uh, the cost of keeping people incarcerated for longer, longer, much longer than they need to be in prison. Um, I, I, there is the economic cost, no question. You know, you talk about someone who deserves to go home, they're under 50, you know, in New York State it's going to cost another 60,000. If they're over 50, it's going to cost, what, like 128,000. Uh, so, it's it, you know so there's that cost but the but the but the cost to society is even greater the cost to each and every one of us when you talk about denying parole to people who have shown that they have earned that opportunity you're not talking just about the individual you're talking about someone who is a mother or a father who is a potential taxpayer, who is a potential leader, someone who could make a difference. This is my motivation. <laughs> so this is what keeps me, you know, doing what I'm doing. Because someone, someone got to teach them. That's time. Brandon as well, um, Oneida. So that's my, that's my basic format. We need fathers out here. I don't know, he showed me his boo-boo. He got poked up by the doctor. <laughs> so, Ow. so you know they gonna come to daddy like daddy he hit me with one he hit me and this and that's the that's that's the pleasure right there, you know so.
another thing is, it's a lot of black fathers out there, and I'm going to speak to you all, because we go through a lot. Keep on going through what you're going through. It's right here. Because the future will be bright. Don't give up and don't leave. And certainly on a personal level, I am married to a man who uh, has just begun his 23rd year in prison. So on a very intimate scale, um, I feel the weight. So we have all of these people who are appointed to run the parole board or office of probation, the Department of Corrections, who come from a punitive perspective, you know, as guards, as police officers. And what we'd actually like to see is people on the parole board that, you know, have worked in social services because they're going to have a different perspective. We want a diverse board that's going to understand that these people aren't just, you know, their DIN number, but they're human beings. They have families. Um, a lot of them have children that they're trying to support. A lot of them have lives before they were in prison and should have the chance to have lives after they're in prison. We need fairer hearings that use objective criteria so that it's not a matter of which parole commissioner you get. It's a matter of following objective criteria based in law so that everyone gets a fair shot. It's impossible to end this film neatly because the work to build a more effective and just parole system is ongoing. Dysfunctional parole is not an isolated issue. The implications of this problem are rooted in larger systems of mass incarceration and socioeconomic and racial injustices. As one person wrote to the Correctional Association in August 2013 after being denied parole release, the Board of Parole said I am incompatible with the welfare of society and that I am a risk to the community. The Board of Parole might as well have been saying I am black and poor and those types of folks are incompatible in America.